Ratio Analysis and Business Performance, Why Should I Care, was a live webinar that was originally produced on Thursday, May 30th, 2019. For this webinar, we were joined by David Blaine and Lindsay Young with McConley and Asbury. We hope you enjoy this recap, and please visit us online at macpas.com for more information about our future webinars and other events. Okay. Um... Mel, thank you very much, or Melissa, thank you very much, appreciate it. My name is David Blaine. I am the partner in charge of the firm's entrepreneurial services group. With me is senior manager, Lindsay. Lindsay, would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, this is Lindsay. I'm excited to be here, thank you. Lindsay, we, we like to call Lindsay, Lindsay Gate Young. <laughs> so Lindsay, welcome, and welcome to everybody out in webinar land for our pr presentation on ratio analysis and business performance, why should I care? So today's uh, objectives will be uh, a couple things. Uh, what we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about ratio analysis as a means to better understand business trends, focus on the ratios that are most commonly used for business valuation, but, most like, but mostly for lenders and other third party users. That's really going to be the focus and intent of today's uh, webinar. Uh, the, the final final objective is uh, to focus on a business, business liquidity and other similar ratios. Future ratios uh, will focus on debt, equity, and income generation. So as we uh, go into today's webinar, um, what we try to do is we try to break the webinar um, into a couple different things. Uh, again, when we talked about the focus, we talked about uh, lenders. And Lindsay, Lindsay and I here, um, as the uh, leaders of our entrepreneurial services group, we work a lot with uh, small businesses, um, entrepreneurial businesses that are constantly in a situation where they're looking for some type, some type of debt financing, line of credit, um, or they're looking for maybe a, um, another investor to come into the business. And um, a lot of times there's more to what these uh, – third parties are looking for than just the financial statements. So they're looking for other trends, so specifically things around liquidity, working capital, and they're looking at a lot of the different ratios that work around the, those, those, um, those numbers. So what we try to do is when we put this webinar together for today is to try to focus on what are some of the types of liquidity, working capital, income statement matters that a lot of these uh, lenders, third party users, and for business valuation purposes um, are, are the most common things that we see out there that we see um, that, that are the questions that are being asked. So we tried to build the webinar today around looking at those specific items. For future webinars, what we'd like to do is have a second webinar sometime into the future that would focus more on the debt and equity type of ratios um, and some other income gener income generation type of ratio analysis um, to kind of piggyback off of what we're going to talk today because there's just so much, Lindsay, don't you agree? There's just so much that these lenders and other third-party users are looking for in regards to data and analytics that um, we could probably talk about this for four hours, but because we only have 50 or all minutes to talk about this, we got to kind of uh, kind of keep it moving. So, Agreed. All right, so the first item we're going to talk about um, so the way we broke this out is that there's three sections. The first section is going to talk a little bit about the income statement um, and looking at some of the, the types of analysis that comes off the income statement. Then the second area is going to be working capital. And then the final area is going to be on more of the liquidity type of ratios. So under the income statement, a couple of things that we're going to look at is uh, the use of vertical analysis when you're looking at your financial statements, uh, the balance sheet, the income statement. Uh, organizational profitability and how some of these third-party um, organizations and lenders look at that. And then uh, we're going to look at product and cost analysis. So the, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, vertical analysis. And vertical analysis, pretty simple really, quite honestly. It's the most common form of income statement analysis. And this is where basically what, we're, what you're doing is, is you're looking at your income statement and you're trying to look for ratios or you're looking for percentages of sales. You're looking at how are my expenses or are my cost of sales being driven by my sales dollars. And that, that's a pretty common analysis that a lot of organizations use. It's uh, And while it's common and it's basic, it's still very good to use from trending purposes when you're looking at the trending of your business 
year over year over year because what you're trying to do is you're trying to see trends in your organization, whether your payroll costs are going up or down as a percentage of your sales. How's that driving the profitability of the product that you're trying to distribute or you're trying to pr produce or, or make? Um, or maybe what you're looking at is how are, I, am I managing my administrative costs and how well am I managing my administrative costs? Because that's really costs that aren't being put into the product, it's the more overhead type of cost. So I think everybody is uh, pretty familiar with with this type of an income statement. I mean, it's a pretty basic income statement where you see the the sales, the cost of sales, the, and you can see the gross profit percentage at the top. The, you see the G&A expenses, selling expenses to get your total expenses down to income from operations, and it ultimately will roll down to net income. So this is a pretty basic income statement, but you can see from the percentage of sales, the vertical looking at the vertical analysis there as you start to look at your uh, percentages of expenses against your revenues. So again, this is a, a pretty common analysis. I don't think there's anything here that is unusual or, or um, you, you know, anything that a lot of people haven't already seen. But I think it's still important to note that when it comes to looking at trends in your business, this is a, even though it's a pretty basic analysis, this is still a really good analysis to use if you want to look at activity of your business year over year over year. Would you would you agree with that, Lindsay? I would. And the nice thing is that when you are running a profit and loss statement for our QuickBooks users out there, um, you have the ability to um, put a little check mark in your customized options to include percentages or comparison uh, values year over year as well. Absolutely, Lindsay. I, I agree with you 100%. So moving on. Um, so as again, we, as we talked about, we tried to kind of structure this a little bit around uh, what, what other third party organizations, specifically in the lending world, uh, information they may want to look at. So one of the other, one of the other items uh, from an income statement perspective is looking at your operating leverage ratio. A lot of times, um, a lot of times lenders want to look at this because they want to kind of look at um, how your sales dollars are being used against a lot of your variable expenses and your operating expenses. So, the uh, so the the way the operating leverage ratio works is it takes your sales less your variable expenses and divides it by your operating expenses. So, in this example, if you were to look at our income statement, our income statement would show sales of two hundred forty dollars. The variable expenses are one hundred seventy five dollars from that from that uh, analysis. You take that number and you divide it by the 26.8, which is the total operating expenses, which would be your your expenses related to um, SG&A and also related to like selling expenses. And that's where you get 2.43 times. So in this instance, we're saying that uh, 2.43 times uh, your, your sales volume is, is what's happening with your expenses. So this ratio is meant to assess the effect of fluctuating sales on operating profit. And this will help you to better analyze where your income risk might be long term inside your business or where your current income risk is. So, again, the ratio allows management to assess that income risk in regards to how they're managing their expenses versus their sales. David, do we want a lower number here or a higher number here? Um, I think what you're looking for here is you want to try to get that, 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 that uh, percentage to be a higher number. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So again, here we go. So the 2.43 means operating income will change 2.43 times that of sales throughout the year. So if you were doing some planning, this is this is actually a really good ratio for planning pers from a planning perspective for your business. If you're doing projections or forecast numbers for the bank, because a lot of times. Uh, your lending institution, if you're trying to get some type of debt financing, they're not only looking at the historical numbers, they're going to look at what's your forecasted number. So this operating ratio is really good from the perspective of looking at forecasted sales or forecasted sales volume against your expenses. Because a good example would be, you know, if you had a 15% increase in sales, what would that mean? Well, that would, if, that would mean that your income from operations would increase approximately 36%. Because in this instance, we're saying that our expenses um, are are being managed pretty well when we say that it's only you know our sales volume is 2.43 times our, our real operating expenses. Um, so 
again, in that instance, you know, an increase of 15% of sales, that's dropping down to bottom line increase, a 36.5% increase, which ultimately is going to convert into cash and cash flow into the business. And that's a lot of times what third parties are looking for is looking for cash flow. Cash is king. All right. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about product cost analysis. You know, most commonly known as cost of goods sold. I think, uh, you know, we, we, we can all, all get on board with that. You know, typically, um, product cost is, consists of expenses that can be directly attributed to the making of the company's product or the rendering of its services. So, again, examples of that would be anything that's the direct cost to, the, to making the product, direct labor, the raw materials to the product, um, equipment, equipment and equipment costs that are related to the product, and, you know, any other associated production costs. So, the, the, you know, the cost of sales formula is going to be pretty simple. It's going to be the cost of sales divided by the sales. So, a lot of times that's kind of called gross profit margin, right? So, in this instance, when we look at the income statement that we presented a little bit earlier, the cost of sales on that income statement was 176.6. Total sales are 240. So right there we're saying the margin is 73, the, the, is 73.6% or the cost of sales formula is 73.6% of sales. So when we talk about this ratio, this ratio is really useful for establishing an average ratio of cost of sales and to confirm if it costs the sales above or below historical averages. So when we were talking a little bit earlier about the vertical analysis, um, this is more of a vertical analysis type of a of a ratio because this is the types of a re this is the types of a historical trends going into the future trends that a lot of times um, the financial financial institutions are looking at because they wanted to look at from the perspective. You know, what are your direct cost of sales? I mean, what are your direct cost of your sales in regards to how your material cost, your your direct labor cost? And they want to see what that trend looks like. And, you know, you know, Lindsay, what I've seen a lot of times is when um we have clients putting together forecasts, sometimes they'll put these forecasts together and not recognize that their cost of sales percentage is, is like drastically declining. So it's making their income levels look really good. But what I don't think they're 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 identifying or they're explaining real well to their financial institutions is why is that decline occurring? Um, because historically, your historical trend was always like 73.6 percent. So why why is it now 65 percent? And I think that sometimes gets them in a little bit of trouble when they're trying to explain that um, explain that away when they're talking to their banker. Agreed. Thanks, Lindsay. All right. <laughs> Ratio also provides a fairly reliable planning statistic, as we were just talking about. So, I mean, it's a, you know, if you're a pretty stable organization, a pretty stable business that you, you see your cost of sales running around 73.6%, you know, historically more likely into the future, as your sales volume goes up, your that cost of sales percentage is probably going to be right in that area. If you're a growing organization that's growing pretty significantly and you had to have a lot of ramp up costs up front, you might see that number come down a little bit as your sales volume continues to increase. But um, you, that's you know it's again it's a good it's good reliable planning statistic to use as you're trying to do forecasting into the future. Also, it's um useful to evaluate individual costs against overall sales. So Instead of just looking at the cost of sales combined as a total, you might want to also look at that by what is my direct labor to sales, what is my raw materials to sales, what is um, what is my equipment usage as a percentage of sales. By looking at that and drilling down into a little bit more of the individual costs, it might give you a little bit of a clearer picture. It might be a better presentation to give to uh, your banker or your other financial or your financial institution as they're trying to get a better understanding on your business and how your business operates. And we also have a couple of clients who include their transportation costs that are a direct cost um, in order to make sure the product is manufactured or is transported between uh, a facility as well. Okay. Very good. All right. So I'm excited about the polling questions. I, I mean, I'm, indeed, you, know, you are. Yes, I didn't. I didn't want anybody out there to think that we were going to have some lame polling questions. So I tried to throw a little bit of something out there for everybody. 
as I looked at some of the attendee list, I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to we're going to take it back a level. We're take it back a little bit here. So the first polling question is this 1980s rock group had the hit had the hit song Jukebox Hero. Who is it? Box Hero. Hero. <laughs> That's right. So um we'll give everybody about a minute to come up with who that might be. I threw this one out there for one of our partners in the firm. Cause I went to, I, I, him and I saw this concert about two years ago. It, they, were, they were here locally. So I threw it out there for him. I kind of figured he'd really like it. So, cause he reminds me of a jukebox hero. <laughs> All right. Okay, so most everybody got that one right. 83%. Yes, it is Farner. Um, those that picked Bon Jovi and Def Leppard, and the person who definitely picked Nirvana, please see me afterwards. No, I'm just kidding <laughs> with you. <laughs> so here's a nice. Yeah, let me see. I'm getting for it. Okay, there's a there's a current picture of the con, of, of the group. Um, what's that? Not not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yet. Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, you know, that, that's a little troubling. Um, but Def Leppard and Bon Jovi are, right? Yeah, that's right. So, Looking okay. Good. All right. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, moving on. All right. That's a great looking picture there of those guys, but, uh, sorry about this guys, but we have to move on. We're coming up on my favorite thing here, David, the balance sheet. I think yeah, I like it more than yeah, I like the uh, profit yeah, and loss I, I statement. You get psyched about your balance sheets. There's no doubt. There's nobody I know more that likes to reconcile account than, than Lindsay H. Young does. This is true. So let's uh, let's talk about the balance sheet a little bit. Um, the two the two fundamental things uh, the, the ability to fund investment and analyzing the balance sheet. So the two fundamental things specifically uh, driving that drive cash flow that drive um, a lot of lending analysis by uh, the lending institutions are around two items really. It's working capital and it's liquidity. Lindsay, why do you think why do you think that's important for the for the banks? Why do you think that they really look really hone in on that outside of looking at the income statement and sales generation and in, in, in EBITDA, but you know, why do you think working capital and liquidity are so important? Well, I think the obvious answer is that they would really like to make sure that you're able to meet your debt obligations. Um, but also, I think the working capital piece shows that you have a little bit of skin in the game as well. Um, so you are actively participating in, in the business. Yeah, Lindsay, you're 100 percent right on both answers. So I mean, most of the time, obviously, you know, these the the bank with the banking regulations that are out there today, uh, you know, they're very tight regulations. They're looking to make sure that you can a number one meet your debt obligations. You are well capitalized enough and funded enough that you can pay the debt back. And the second thing is, um, obviously, um, the fact that they want to make sure that you know, do you have some skin in the game and that you have a vested interest in the business as much as they have a vested interest in getting paid back. Sure. So let's talk about working capital a little bit here. Um, so what we did is we put together a nice looking balance sheet for everybody to take a look at. And on this balance sheet, we have, um, you, you know, it's we have your basic current asset accounts, cash, accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid. Total current assets on this balance sheet are 78.1. And about 68% of the total assets relate to current assets. Then your property, plant, and equipment, unless you accumulate depreciation, make up 35.8 of the dollars or 31.4% of the balance sheet. So total assets on this balance sheet are 113.9. So really, when you look at this balance sheet, um, not, not too bad to start with. Let's look at the liability side, which is the next page. So on the liability side, you have your payables of 20.8, your accrued expenses, 3.6. And your current portion of long-term debt is 5.1. So your current liabilities are 29.5. So when we get into talking about some of the liquidity ratios, you, we'll, we'll be able to talk a little bit about the fact that uh, from a current perspective, they're they're a pretty strong organization. Uh, long-term debt's 26.7, which makes up about 23% of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, liability side of the of the uh, of the of the equation. So it's a little high, but, I mean, but not too bad, not something that's not unmanageable. And then their equity section is pretty strong, I would say. You know, you got your common stock, you got your paid in capital, retained earnings at 27.9. So, you know, 50% of your of your equity liability side is in equity. That's pretty strong, uh, I would say, pretty decent balance sheet from what we can see so far. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to dig into some of the percentages and see some of the analysis to see, see what that, if that's telling us anything different. 
All right. So working capital, you know, working capital, the, 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 the um, the equation that's expressed for it's pretty simple. Current assets less current liabilities is your working capital. So in the instance of what we just saw, we saw current assets at 78.1 and we saw current liabilities at 29.5. So that's actually pretty strong. You know, we're saying that your 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 working capital position is 48.6. So we're saying that you have enough in current assets that are liquid enough that you could that you have free and available cash, 48.6, to service any remaining debt, uh, long-term debt, or any other types of capital financing that you want to do for the business. So clearly, you know, the greater the working capital, the greater the liquidity of the business. Um, you know, just until, just as we talk about working capital a little bit, Lindsay, this is this is something that you know, at, at least from some of the some of some of our clients, um, it, wow, it's a pretty basic equation. It, sometimes some of our clients do struggle with this a little bit in, in understanding it. Would you agree with that? I do agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that working capital looks at things as of a point in time, right? So you're looking at it from the point in time because your balance sheet's as of a point in time. A lot of times, though, we need to look at average working capital, and average working capital is helping us understand better what what is – our average capital needs for the last 12 months or for a 12-month period or what we might need going forward into the future. So when we're looking for average working capital, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, you know, there's it's computed by adding the working capital values at the beginning and the ending and the ending of the accounting period and dividing it by two. And by doing that, identifying average working capital helps businesses to better understand liquidity needs throughout the year. So again, as I was saying before, you know, the balance sheet being at its point in time um, is just telling us as of today, this is kind of what our working capital position is. A lot of times, lending institutions, other investors, they want to kind of get a better feel for well, what is the average amount of working capital that I actually need to have month over month over month to better to better uh, fund my business, to better operate my business. So in the event that, you know, from a from a pure operations perspective, how much cash do I need to have on hand? How much, how much total working capital do we need to have on hand as I'm projecting into the future? Well, and this allows us to meet our payroll obligations. It allows us to meet our property plan and equipment purchases uh, for the future as well. Right. So in this instance, you know, in this example, if we were just to, if we were to assume that our working capital at the beginning, at the beginning of the period was 46.2. And our average working capital would be calculated as the 46.2 plus the 48.6, which is the ending working capital that we just calculated on the previous sheet. And if we divide that by two, that tells us that our average working capital is about 47.4. So again, this is more used, I would say, as a planning tool, right? So if you were an acquirer, if you're acquiring the business, right, you'd be saying to yourself, well, you know, your working capital at this X point in time looks pretty strong, but for the next 12 months as I acquire your business, what what is the what is the average working capital requirements am I going to need for the business on a month-over-month -month basis so I can plan for that? That's really a good example of why understanding what your average working capital is going to be is, is relatively important. One of the uh, additional thoughts, David, is, you know, you know, I often get the question from variety of new startup clients, how much money do I need to put into the business to start it up? Um, and sometimes those capital investments, um, you know, really do show that you do have that skin in the game. And the more that you're able to fund into the business is certainly a helpful. Yeah, that's a really item. good point. Even from an acquisition standpoint, I mean, we see that all the time that part of part of what's worked into the, the, the purchase price is going to be having an average amount of working capital on hand uh, to operate the business for the next 60 or 90 days or 120 days um, as part of the as, as part of the uh, as part of the funds available for for the uh, of the proceeds of the purchase price. So, okay. So coming off of average working capital, then what we want to look at also so, uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, lending institutions ask questions about working capital turnover. So working capital turnover is the ratio of sales to the average working capital. Why, why, why would you think that this is important? That's a really good question, Dave. Why is this important? Well, if you look at bullet point number four, it will tell you that it indicates how well management is using working capital to generate revenues. Just checking in on you. <laughs> Thanks. 
but no, on 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 a, on a serious note, though, I mean, at working capital turnover is 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 reviewed by a lot of uh, third party organizations, institutions, because they want to see how well they want to see how well management is operating the business. A part of oper and part of looking at management's operation of the business is how are they using working capital. How effectively and efficiently is it being used inside the business? So we should be both seeing a net income here and increased revenue. Yeah, exactly right. So working capital ratio is the sales divided by the average working capital. So in this instance, if you looked at um, our income statement from before, sales was two four, were two forty. Our average working capital, as we calculated on the past page, was forty seven point four. So in this instance, what they're saying is that working capital. As as that percentage of sales is 5.06 times, it's it's it is generating 5.06 times itself in sales. So the higher, obviously, the higher that ratio is, the better sales generation we're getting. Um, so we're always so a lot of times you're going to see that um, third parties are looking at this ratio because they want to see again how well is management using their working capital to generate sales. Is it is so the higher that ratio, the better off that looks. And you know, from a valuation perspective, um, if Eric Blocker was here, I think he's he's on on this thing. But if Eric was was here, he would probably say that, you know, the the use of working capital and how it generates sales obviously is ca generating cash flow, generating that cash flow is generating additional value in the business. So. Well, and from a forecasting perspective, we could also use. Um, our pipeline of you know lead generated revenue to figure out well where we're going in the future as well. Right, exactly. So next thing um that's that's looked at a lot is uh, the working capital to sales ratio. So here what we're doing is we're taking the average working capital and this is against annualized sales. Okay, so we're looking at when we look at annualized sales, we're looking at a 12 month picture. Um, in the instance of these financial statements, they are 12 month. They are 12 month income statements. So that 240 is the number we're going to work with on this example. So in this instance, really, what you're doing is you're just taking the inverse of the last equation, and you're saying 47.4 is my average working capital when divided by 240. So 20 percent of my 20 percent of my um, working capital is in my sales and. In this instance, the, the primary use of this ratio is to arrive at a working capital, work, what your working capital needs are given a sales projection. So this is a ratio that you're going to use more in regards to your projecting into the future and your forecasting into the future to give you a better understanding of if my sales increase by X, what does that mean to my working capital? And what, how, how should I make sure that as I project my balance sheet, that my balance sheet would look compared to my sales volume for this working capital ratio? All right, next one, working capital to funded debt. Now, again, um, we do plan to have a second webinar. And in the second webinar, we're going to do, we're going to focus more on equity. We're going to focus more on debt, debt to equity ratios. Uh, and we're also going to focus a little bit more on the income statement and some of the different types of income statement analysis. So, but we did feel like um, looking at, you know, looking at funded debt versus working capital is critical and we should probably include that into this analysis here um, as part of any types of working capital analysis that you're, that you're doing within your organization. So in this instance, the average working capital is divided by the average value of funded or long-term debt. So looking at our example in our income statement again, 47.1 is the average working capital. We're going to divide that by a 26.7, which is the funded debt on the balance sheet. Okay, that's the long-term debt, the long-term portion of the debt, not the current portion, the long-term piece. So in this instance, we're saying 1.76 is the working capital times the value of the debt. Okay, so this ratio answers the question as to whether an organization could liquidate its long-term debt from working capital. If the ratio is greater than one, then yes. If it's less than one, then no. Again, this is something that um, the banks and the financial institutions want to be able to see that you can ultimately, at the end of the day, pay the debt, pay the debt payments, fund the debt, and if you need to pay it off, you would have the ability to pay it off. So. Most banks will look at from a debt, you know, we a lot of times we talk about debt to equity debt to equity ratios. 
Um, this is not quite a debt to equity ratio. It's more looking at the funded debt versus working capital. But in this instance, having that percent, having that um, ratio that's greater than one just means that you have enough working capital there to pay your debt, to fund the debt, to pay the debt down, which is something that the banks and lending institutions are looking for. And that's where businesses are starting to accumulate and grow their capital account by leaving money in the business to fund future obligations. They're not utilizing it all today or withdrawing it all out of the business today. Right. One thing that we should you should take into mind is that you know caution should be taken regarding how much working capital is in cash versus the current assets. Uh, so lack of available cash could still cause inability to meet debt obligations. So on our balance sheet, that is one area on this balance sheet that, that isn't exactly the strongest because if you recall, the balance sheet showed 3.5 was the cash balance, 28.7 was receivables, 44.8 was inventory. So a lot of the current assets in this balance sheet are actually tied up in either accounts receivable or inventory. But then again, we're going to talk about this in a little bit when we get to liquidity, but that could be you know, it, it all depends on what type of industry you're in and how, how cash intensive that industry is. Some industries, um, you know, you, having a higher AR balance and inventory balances and a lower level of cash is okay. Some industries it's not. So it all depends on what industry you're in and what, it, what are some of the analytics within your own industry that, you know, that would tell you what those balances should be. All right. So... There is some other working capital calculations that are out there, but we're not going to, we just don't have the time to really uh, dig into them. But there is the current assets to working capital ratio, and then there's the vice versa, that the working capital to current assets ratio. And those ratios, same thing with liabilities against working capital, and then there's the inventory to working capital. Again, all, all really good analysis to run depending on the type of business you are, especially the last one, inventory to working capital. If you're a... If you're a manufacturer, this will help you to better manage how much inventory is, how much inventory versus working capital is there. Kind of going back to what I said earlier, um, you know, if you have, if, if a lot of your working capital is tied up in inventory, well, that might make it a little bit difficult to li liquidate that inventory if you needed to really get the cash immediately, which we're going to talk a little bit about here in a second when we get the liquidity. Looks like we've arrived at polling question number two. All right. So um, this polling question is for one of our one of our McConley and Asbury staff as well. That I know he's a big Pittsburgh Steelers guy. Um, and you know the funny thing is, Lindsay is I grew up I grew up in Central Pennsylvania, right? And I couldn't stand the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I probably know more about the Pittsburgh Steelers than most Pittsburgh Steelers fans do. You're an anything sports guy, really. Not, not really, but when I grew up in this, when I grew up in this area in the '70s and early '80s, there was no other football team but the Pittsburgh Steelers in this area because the Eagles were awful, and the Baltimore Colts were moving from Baltimore to Indianapolis. So, but anyways, so this famous Pittsburgh Steeler also ran for governor of Pennsylvania in 2006. So who is it? Could it be A. John Stallworth, B. Lynn Swan, C. Jerome Bettis? or B, Franco Harris. So let's see how this goes. We'll give everybody a minute to answer this polling question. So my polling questions are, and people are picking up my polling questions pretty good. 17% knew it was Lynn Swan. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, because Lynn Swan ran for governor in 2006, was the Republican candidate against former mayor of Philadelphia and governor Ed Rendell. And he got, he got pretty much beat pretty good. So that was the end of that. And we never heard from Lynn Swan again politically. So, all right. Let's move on here. So last last, uh, last area we're at now is going to be, uh, oh, wait, we got to stop. There's, there we go. Lynn Swan, four-time Super Bowl champion. Four-time. Look at, look at the guy. Look at the guy. He's, he looks like he could be out there running past patterns right now. All right. Let's get the liquidity. So the last item that we're going to talk about today is liquidity. Um, again, um, we tried to, uh, you know, as, just as a re refresher for this webinar, we just wanted to make sure that the first, the first webinar that we did on these on ratios, we focused on um, key areas uh, to start with that, that that would generate cash flow, which would be income statement, sales, working capital, liquidity type of type of areas. 
So um, the liquidity of a business is its capability to meet current debt obligations. A reasonably sound liquidity position enables an organization to obtain the financing to take advantage of investment opportunities and respond to operational emergencies. So liquidity ratios measure how well a corporation is able to meet its obligations. I, I think we, you know, I think everybody um, is pretty well familiar with with that definition of what liquidity is. Uh, I don't think there's anything there um, that would shock anybody. So the first, I, so here's kind of a rundown of some of the common liquidity ratios that we're going to talk about. Uh, there's the current or working capital ratio, the asset test ratio, cash ratio, cash turnover ratio, accounts receivable, and total asset turnover. These are the ones that we're going to talk about mostly um, here um, as we get ready to uh, move forward here. So first one, the current or working capital ratio. So this, when we went and looked at working capital, working capital formula was current assets less current liabilities. So this just kind of looks at the ratio of comparing current assets to current liabilities. So in our, so in our example from our balance sheet, 78.1 was the current assets, 29.5 was the current liability. So in this instance, um, when we were talking a little bit earlier, Lindsay, we were saying, you know, the balance sheet looked relatively strong you know, from, you know, the, the initial review. And this would tell you, this would kind of lead you to believe that as well, because we're saying that 2.65 times um, the, the, the assets versus the liabilities in the business. So that means you could pay your liabilities 2.65 times. And, and, and if, especially if you're 29.5 of your current liabilities were all due within 30 days, you'd have enough assets there for the next three months to make sure you paid your liabilities. So this ratio indicates the number of times current assets will pay off current liabilities, as we just talked about. Uh, in most, most ideal, the ratio that you would look for here is two to one. Um, that would be most ideal. I mean, that's basically saying that you, you, you're, pretty flush, you're pretty flush with current assets versus your liabilities position. Most banks look for a ratio that, that it's a minimum at least greater than 1.2 to one when considering make the, the ability to making monthly loan payments. One of the most common questions I get, Dave, from clients is, how do I, put me in the best light possible. Give me the best, you know, presentation on my financial statements. You know, it's kind of, uh, you know, black and white in terms of numbers when it comes to what's out there in assets and what's out there in liabilities. How do you see presenting this to banks in a positive light? Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good question, Lindsay. I mean, it, and you know, it can be driven by industry too. I mean, some industries just have naturally a lower, uh, you know, lower current current ratio, current working capital ratio versus some industries. Uh, really, I think it is dependent upon industry. I mean, you want to the one thing you want to do in when you're trying to go for, in my mind, when you're trying to go for bank financing, is you got to position the business to to you got to position the business as best you can so so cleaning um, up cleaning up some of those cleaning old up some of that exactly you know so you know liabilities it, taking care of some lower debt obligations it, it, all exactly. kind of present yourselves in a, a poor yeah. more positive light it, that's it, that's exactly right because that will eliminate some of those monthly payments that you have to make hopefully over time that's going to generate more cash flow which ultimately will, will increase your current ratio okay so then coming off the uh, current ratio is what's called the asset test ratio. So this ratio is very similar to the current ratio. Uh, the difference in this ratio is that we're looking at more of the, the more liquid assets that exist than just the than just looking at total current assets. So for instance, we would I think it's easy to say cash and marketable securities are pretty liquid. You can usually get access to that right away. Um, accounts receivable would be somewhat liquid as well. If you you know if you had to collect on accounts receivable, you could probably pick the phone up and make a phone call. Um, so as long as your client, as long as your client's cash <laughs> positive and they can make the payment right away, right? The one thing it does not count does not count in the in the asset test ratio would be like inventories because inventories, well, most of the time inventories will turn um, relatively quickly, or you can turn them quickly. The fact is that that's a hard asset that it might take some it might take more time to turn that than just making a phone call and having a check sent to you. So this asset test ratio is not going to include inventory. So if you're a late if you're a heavy inventory intensive business, um, 
your current ratio might look really good, but your asset test ratio might tell a different story because you might not have the liquid assets available um, that you think you have to make current debt payments. So uh, these assets are considered the quickest to convert to cash in the case of immediate cash needs. So an example from our example balance sheet, you're going to take the cash of 3.5, the AR of 28.7. There were no marketable securities on our balance sheet, so there would be no marketable securities to add there. You would divide that then against the 29.5, which is your current liabilities. And what this is telling us is that 1.09 times your your um, your current assets less inventory against your current liabilities you could pay down. So um, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, Lindsay, we were saying it looks like a pretty strong balance sheet. But then when you look at the asset test ratio, it's telling you that it, it's it's a strong balance sheet, but we're pretty leveraged on the inventory side. And because we're, we're so leveraged on the inventory side, there is a little bit of risk in regards to being able to convert that to cash. Time to run a sale, Dave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe time to liquidate some of that inventory. And All collect right. on those old AR. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, the next one is uh, the cash ratio. So the cash ratio is really, this is just taking the asset test ratio and now just eliminating AR and just saying, what currently do I have in cash to be able to pay my current debt, current liability obligations? That's really the, 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 the difference in this ratio versus the asset test. So if you look at this, it's just three, in our example from our balance sheet, it's 3.5 was cash, 29.5 is current liability. So this represents basically saying that, you know, 12% of your cash covers your current liabilities or it's what you got cash to cover 12% of your current liabilities. So th th this is a, this is a hard ratio sometimes to look at because the reality is a lot of businesses don't hold a lot of cash and a lot of businesses don't hold marketable securities. Although I do have one client that holds a significant amount of like marketable securities, but most clients don't. I mean, it's just, that's just, they don't. Um, so one thing you have to keep in mind is that there is no normal cash ratio applicable to all companies and management should evaluate its own ratio in light of corporate objectives and policies as well as industry norms. And, you know, a lot of times businesses have lines of credit, um, so they might not hold a lot of cash um, because they utilize their line of credit and they can use that line of credit if need be to pay certain liabilities. So um, again, you want to kind of look at this ratio a little bit more from the perspective of what's the average, what's the norm in your in your industry. Some industries, you know, you have a lot of cash. Some industries you don't. Okay. Uh, the next one is the cash turnover ratio, and this would be your cash divided, your sales divided by your cash. So this is, you know, pr pr pretty simple. What we're trying to figure out here is. You know how well are we? How well is our cash generating revenues? So in this instance, we're saying that if our sales are 240 and our cash position is 3.5, we're saying that our cash is generating 68 is gener is turning itself over 68.66 times. So this ratio can be used to analyze and assess the effectiveness of the organization's use of cash to generate revenue. Turnover rate is helpful in determining preliminary cash balance forecast based on projected sales. And obviously in this instance, you know, the higher the ratio, the more the more effective use of cash. So basically again, what we're saying is if you're this three, you know, 3.5 is generating a pretty significant amount of sales throughout the year. Um, so that that's a good thing. If it was 3.5 generating 10 in sales, then you would say to yourself, my my not using my cash to the best of its ability. Okay. All right, next one is accounts receivable turnover. Um, now, this is kind of important. A lot of times, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of bankers like to look at this one. And the reason why they want to look at this, they want to see how liquid your receivables are and how quickly you're turning your receivables over because that's cash. Cash is king. That's going to help, that's going to help finance debt and be able to pay down debt. So in this instance, um, the, 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 uh, the equation for this is pretty simple. We're just going to take, we're going to look at sales and we're going to divide it by the AR balance. Um, as of a point in time. So at this point, 240 was our sales from our income statement. 28.7 was our AR balance. So what this is telling me is that my AR is a percentage of my sales is 8.3. I'm turning it over 8.36 times, basically. Okay. 
So this ratio is normally expressed as an annual figure and not quarterly. So this is one thing you got to keep in mind is that whatever you do, you have to make sure you look at this from an annualized sales perspective. You don't want to just say, okay, my first three months of sales are X and my AR balance at the end of that period is, is Y because it's going to give you a, a, a skewed skew. Skewed, a skewed turn on your AR. You got to look at this from an annualized sales perspective because it, usually your AR is considered an annualized number, right? So receivable turnover is best an, 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 analyzed by comparing to trends in sales and receivables over a number of time periods. Okay. And receivable turnover helps companies to better understand cash flow and ability to collect on receivables timely. Okay. Almost through, we got just a few more slides, another polling question, and we'll go to some, uh, we got one or two questions that have come in since that we can, uh, we can address here. So we're at 246. Everybody out in, in, in webinar land, just hang tight. It's just give us about 15 more minutes here. So uh, asset turnover ratio, um, this is uh, another ratio that's, that's, that's looked at from the perspective of uh, third parties and lending institutions. They want to know how well you're using your assets, how well you're turning over these assets as compared to sales. So in this instance, the ratio is pretty simple. It's just sales divided by total assets. In our example, 240 was our sales and our total asset balance was 113.9. So basically what we're saying is our assets make up 2.11 of our total sales volume. Similar to what we've seen in the past here, Lindsay, you know that obviously the higher that ratio is, the better off you are. That means that your assets are working for you to generate sales. Um, and that's what you want. Uh, the ratio can be used to analyze and assess effectiveness of the organization's use of its total assets. Again, that's uh, some, something that, uh, that, uh, that lending institutions, third parties are looking at. They want to know how effective is the use of your assets um, or how effectively are you deploying your assets to generate sales and just sales volume. Okay. Uh, two more things here. Uh, to some other key balance sheet matters are fixed assets to total sales ratio and investors' capital to total sales ratio. Let me go into those two real quick. Um, won't spend too much time on these, but fixed assets to total sales. Again, it's just sales against fixed assets. Um, in our example, it's the 240 of the sales. 35.8 was our net fixed assets at the end. So we're saying that our, our fixed assets are generating 6.7 times our sales. Which is pre which is pretty good. Um, you know, while fixed assets in, in themselves do not produce sales, without them, only limited sales can be made in a pr product-oriented company. I think that's pretty pretty common, pretty common sense. I don't think there's anything rocket science there. And this ratio provides insight into capacity. So this will help you to better understand, you know, what what your capacity is as a percentage of your sales and and how much more inside the organization can you possibly do with, with the current assets that you have. And manage your future growth. I mean, yes, exactly right, Lindsay. Final item here is investor capital to sales ratio. Um, that would be stockholders equity to sales. In our example, stockholders equity was 57.7, our sales were 240. So basically what this percentage reflects is the percentage of sales financed by stockholders equity. Um, in, in this instance, it's 24%, which, which is a pretty strong percentage. So the higher the ratio indicates the sales are being fueled by capital, the lower the percentage, therefore, more favorable the company's position. Um, so again, 240 against 57.7 is not too bad um, as a percentage. That means you got a decent capital position, but it's really generous. But 240 on that sales or, or, or of sales on that is pretty good. Okay. Um, we're going to get to the final polling question, I think, which is my favorite polling question. Um, in summary, though, we're going to say, you know, the, the, the focus on ratio analysis along with traditional financial statement review will help you to better position your company for future capital needs as well as possible increase in business value through better cash flow management. I mean, I think that's what we tried to do today with this presentation where we're looking at the ratios around the income statement and liquidity and working capital. Um, and ultimately, you know, by, by looking at those for cash flow needs and cash flow purposes, that's going to better position you when you want to look at things like additional debt financing for capital equipment or get that um, line of credit that you need. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, here we go. Polling question number three, who is gritty? 
Is he is gritty a player for the Philadelphia Phillies? Is he is he a Sesame Street character? Is he the mascot of the Philadelphia Flyers, or is he an English Premier League player? So we're gonna let everybody take a minute here or two to identify who Gritty is. I know one person out there in webinar land who's probably just sitting outside this door right now who knows Gritty. <laughs> he talks about Gritty all the time, doesn't he, Lindsay? He does. Yeah, he does. All right, here we go. Let's let's look at the results for Gritty. Wow, wow 84% of the people knew who Gritty is. <laughs> I mean, wow, that, that that is excellent. But I guess you'd have to be hiding under a rock if you didn't really know who Gritty is. I mean, Gritty's been all over the news since uh, the start of the hockey season last year. Let's take a look at Gritty here. Look at that guy. That's one. <laughs> that's one creepy mascot. I gotta tell you, but but I mean, I mean, he's a creepy mascot. I mean, there's just no questions asked about that. But that's Gritty. So 84% of everybody knows who Gritty is. That's great. All right. So there's a picture of myself and Lindsay. We appreciate everybody's time today. Um, Dave, do we have any moments for a, a polling question? Yeah, we do. Maybe we do because we got a couple polling questions that have come in here. All right. So, Lindsay, it looks like the first question says, can you utilize ratios in addition to the analysis of your profit and loss statement to further project and potentially create a budget? Lindsay, what do you think about that? I think that's another great question. And certainly, yes, you can use your ratios, specifically your cost of sales ratios. I think they will aid in your ability to project future cost of sales in connection with your anticipated revenue growth, that pipeline that you've been generating. Um, creating that budget or that forecast would then I think be the natural next step to managing your future growth plans, um, including cost of sales, overhead expenses, um, then reports can be generated to compare and forecast amounts to actual or compare them to actual. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you there, Lindsay. I mean, you, definitely as you're producing budgets and forecasts, you know, you're going to want to do a vertical analysis. You're going to want to do some analysis around some of the, some of your some of your different uh, working capital and liquidity ratios. So as you're preparing your income statement, it kind of matches up with your balance sheet and you can kind of get a feel for what the next 12 months are going to look like from cash needs, cash perspective. So, all right, that's the first question. Another good question that just came in is, it is a good idea to have more revenue and expense categories and loss on your profit and loss statement to better track and monitor cost of sales. So I think the question here is whether or not you'd like to see more categories of revenue and more categories of expenses. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that's the way it's it looks like that's the way it was uh, generated here. So, and it, I think that's a preference thing, really. Um, showing more specific line items can allow you to better or closely monitor um, your percentage of sales um, and then also monitor your cost of sales uh, directly attributed to those revenue categories. Um, you can easily see your expenses um, specific to a revenue stream and then possibly even look for potential creep or increased um, expenses and kind of identify or analyze why uh, those costs are going up. Um, certainly, you could also make future decisions on raising selling prices if you're seeing a new um, cost growth um, in one specific area of your business. You might need to increase um, your selling price on a specific product. Yeah, I would agree with you, Lindsay. I mean, I think the one area we talked about under vertical analysis was the ability to dig into the cost of sales area, for, for, for instance, and look at the multiple line items inside there, whether it's direct labor, working uh, your um, your machinery and equipment cost, and um, that's going to I think again by breaking it down and having it, and having a more detailed look there, you're going to be able to track those percentages a little bit better. You're going to be able to see how that how those costs are are driving sales, and you can use that for forecasting purposes in the future. So, all right, what do we got here? We got one more question that just came in here. It is. Regarding cash ratios, does it make sense to leave money in the business or withdraw money from the business? You know, that's a that's a good question. You know what I mean? How many how cash often is do we, king? Uh, yeah, I mean, how often do we have clients that come back to us at the end of the year and they have they made profit, 
they made profit, they made money, they have cash in the business and they're not sure whether should I draw the money out of the business and get it out of the business or should I uh, keep that money in the business uh, for capital purposes um, because they're also trying to uh, maybe manage their uh, maybe manage their uh, working capital positions with their banks and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a it's, fine line, really. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, if you're an S corporation or a partnership, you know, you probably want to, you don't want to take all your money out of the business, but you probably want to take a decent amount of that money out of the business just because you want to keep it, you know, for liability perspective or legal perspectives, having, you know, get, you want to get that, get your profitability out of the business um, and into your hands personally, but you also got to kind of manage it a little bit with what are your capital needs in the business and what are you going to need into the future? That's where, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a real balancing act as to, you know, what your debt position is, how, how, how do you want to manage your debt position? Um, do you want to, is it, you know, is it more cost effective to take that extra cash and pay down your debt, you know, cause your debt balance, your debt percentage interest rates much higher than, you taking the money out of the business and uh, sitting on it in a in your bank account for one percent. You know what I mean? There's a lot of different variables there. I think that uh, that um, you know it's it's different business to business and owner to owner. Would you agree with that, Lindsay? I do. I think um, I think it definitely helps us to make uh, future business decisions um, and certainly meet our obligations or decide whether we right. want to reinvest. Right. Okay. I don't see any other questions that have come in. Um, and ironically, we're like right on time. It's almost three o'clock. So I'm going to turn this back over to Mel. I want to say thank you to everybody for attending. Please look for our next webinar on business ratios. There'll be a part two to this webinar where we're going to talk a little bit more on the on equity and debt and some other really cool things on the income statements. And more good polling questions, and maybe. Great more good polling questions looking forward to looking forward to the challenge because i'm a little disappointed in my polling questions everybody was able to answer them so easily but that's okay all right so let's turn it back over to melissa roberson and she's going to um do her thing thank you once again for joining us for this webinar recap produced by mcconley and asbury we hope you join us for our future webinars you can stay connected and learn more about all of our upcoming events by visiting us at macp as.com. Thanks again and have a great day.